first, of course, I'd like to welcome our author this evening, Mary Roach. And also, I'd like to thank the ASUC Bookstore for being here tonight to sell not only Mary's books, but we also have Vikram Chandra and Melanie Abrams' books as well. You might want to check those out. <laughs> and Mary has been kind enough to agree to sign after the reading, so we all appreciate that. So just some housekeeping issues, please silence your cell phones or anything that might make noise or disturb anyone during the reading. Also, you can sign up for our mailing list on the front desk here. There's um, you can get story hour updates as well as general library updates. You can also find us on Facebook if you would like to be our friend. We'd feel much more popular, so check us out there. You can also find us on storyhour.berkeley.edu. We have um, the schedule for our upcoming authors as well as webcasts of previous readings. And our sister program, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you can find their schedule there as well. And now I'll turn it over to Melanie Abrams, who will introduce Mary Roach. Thank you. It's my pleasure today to introduce Mary Roach, who is the author of Stiff, Spook, and Bonk, which is pretty much the history of life. Bonk, <laughs> stiff, spook. <laughs> anyway, I'll let Mary uh, tell you <laughs> the history of her life. She says, I grew up in a small house in Etna, New Hampshire. My dad was 65 when I was born. My neighbors taught me how to drive a skidoo and shoot a rifle, though I never made much use of these skills. I graduated from Wesleyan in 1981 and drove out to San Francisco with some friends. I spent a few years working as a freelance copy editor before landing a half-time PR job at the San Francisco Zoo. My office was in a trailer, trailer next to Gorilla World. On the days when I wasn't taking calls about elephant wart removal or denying rumors that the cheetahs had been sucked dry by fleas, I wrote freelance articles for the local newspaper Sunday Magazine. Eventually, my editors there moved on to better things and bigger things and took me along with them. I first encountered Mary's writing when I read Stiff, which is about what happens after you die. As Mary tells us, you can get used for medical experimentation, get squished in carefully constructed accidents by transport safety engineers, eaten by cannibals, disposed of in many creative ways, including composting, and of course, you can decay, which turns out to be a complex and fascinating process. This book, which treats the nasty facts about mortality with utter frankness, made me very happy. What's wonderful about Mary's writing is not only that she can write about the subtleties of scientific investigation for the layperson without condescending simplifications, but also that she is a consummate storyteller, one who treats what most of us fear with invigorating humor and hope. And in fact, I will say that in my creative writing class where students have to go to see um, fiction, poetry, or playwriting reading, uh, play writing or play, I had told them they could come to see <laughs> this nonfiction reading because the storytelling part of it is really excellent as well. Um, Stiff was a New York Times bestseller, was selected as one of the best books of 2003 by many publications ranging from the San Francisco Chronicle to NBR's Science Friday. Entertainment Weekly called it one of the funniest and un most unusual books of the year and added that it was gross, educational, and unexpectedly side-splitting. Mary went past death with her next book, Spook, in which she asks that question to which all of us urgently want to answer. Do we have a soul that survives when we quit our mortal coils? Mary's investigations led her into the byways of faith and science. She travels with ghost investigators trying to record conversations that the Donner Party is still having, goes to medium school, talks to scientists studying near-death experiences. Again, that engaging wit and curiosity and skepticism is on display in every sentence, and yet even the most wide-eyed believers, such as the man who has weighed a dog's soul, are never mocked or belittled. The New York Times reviewer noted, what Mary Roach celebrates is the passion that drives the inquiry, that keeps people at their research despite the loneliness and mockery. She may have a skeptic's mind, but she writes with a believer's heart. Mary's latest investigative journal chronicled and the aptly named Bonk, which a lot of my students, are you going to talk about the word? Okay, so a lot of my students didn't know what Bonk came from. It's, or they had kind of, uh, they said Boink, but Bonk is actually, and I actually think I heard that from you at the other, it's a, it's a British euphemism, well, right? I grew up in New England, and it was, it was who, who Bonk? Was really yeah, <laughs> right. But I actually have, I didn't bring them, but I have little peel and stick letter I. Oh, funny. I feel very strongly that it should be joint for people, so I wish people would stick or they could stick it on a 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, so Bonk has again been picked as one of the best books of 2008 by the San Francisco Chronicle and others. And in it, she asks again those questions which haunt us. Is orgasm a myth? Can a dead man get an erection? Why doesn't Viagra help women? Or for that matter, pandas? Again, the answers she finds in her travels along the way to these answers are a joy for the reader. I could go on, but I'll leave you with what the reviewer for the Chronicle says. If Mariette Roach ever writes a book called Worm, The Curious Science of Deep Sea Tube Worms and Hydrothermal Vents, I would still read it. <laughs> Without further ado, may I present Mary Roach. Thank you, Melanie, so much. Um, is there a little light here? Otherwise, I'll have to wear these the entire time. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Turn it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly today um, about uh, Bonk, which is my sex lab book. And um, this is a book I got interested in. It's one of people often say, well, how did you get the idea for your book? And um, this was one where I was reading a, a, an old copy of Film Quarterly. And I don't know why. I don't subscribe to Film Quarterly, but I have this memory of leafing through. And there was a reference to the um, colposcopic films of Masters and Johnson. And I thought, well, that's odd. What's a colposcopic film? Col colposcopy is when they take you know, a biopsy on the cervix. So that's kind of. So anyway, it turns out um, that Masters and Johnson, may, these were you know, the famous sexual physiology researchers of the 60s. They um, invented basically a penis camera, which would, because uh, they were trying to document female sexual response. Uh, and a lot of that's going on inside. And it's so how do you? study that. Well, you know, to get in there, you've got to, uh, you know, while someone's responding, I mean, they thought, thought this through, and they thought, I know, we'll make a penis camera and film with it through this phallus, and I thought, God, sex research, that's got to be the next book. Um, <laughs> it was literally that moment where I thought, I know what my next book is, and because I, I really hadn't, I'd never read Masters and Johnson, I didn't really know much about their work, and I thought, what, what a wonderful science to study, because sex is this intimate, sort of personal um, activity. But on the other hand, sex is physiology and anatomy. And you have to study it. Someone's got to study it. And how awkward is that? I mean, who do you get to come into the lab? And who do you wire up? And who's going to do that? And, and what's the ethics of it? So I thought that um, that, that seemed like a promising world to venture into. And just to give you a sense of um, just to, I, there's, I'm going to read you a footnote, and I love this footnote because it really, for me, captures the unique hurdles and challenges of being a sexual physiology researcher. <clears throat> and it's about, um, it's about a researcher named Giles Brindley, who's, who's British. Um, he's actually a urologist. Okay. <clears throat> At a 1983 urology conference, Brindley delivered a lecture about a new impotency drug, papaverine that produced robust erections when injected directly into the penis. He began by showing his audience, a group of around 80 urologists and their wives, many en route to the conference cocktail party and dressed in formal attire, a series of slides of his own penis <laughs> at various dosages. He then revealed that five minutes earlier, he had injected himself with papaverine. He pulled the fabric of his tracksuit tightly against his hips to reveal the outline of his medicated member. Not satisfied, he then pulled down his pants, revealing, in the words of eyewitness Lawrence Klotz, quote, a long, thin, clearly erect penis. <laughs> Klotz's account of the event was published in British Journal of Urology International in 2005. And I'm going to continue with Dr. Klotz's um, description. Brindley paused, seeming to ponder his next move. The sense of drama in the room was palpable. He then said with gravity, I'd like to give some of the audience the opportunity to confirm the degree of tumescence. <laughs> with his pants at his knees, he waddled down the stairs. <laughs> As he approached the audience, erection waggling before him, four or five of the women in the front rows threw their arms in the air and screamed. <laughs> The screams seemed to shock Professor Brindley, who rapidly pulled up his trousers and terminated the lecture. <laughs> so um, that, I think, you know, you get, get a sense of what, um, what it's like to be a sex researcher. You know, it's, it's your, he obviously was very excited about this finding, you know. I mean, <laughs> and I didn't even mean to. <laughs> when, you, when you write a book on, on sex, you, uh, everything, 
everything is a pun or a double entendre. I mean, I, I, at one point, you know the, the, the columnist John Carroll, he was um, doing a piece uh, in his column. He made a reference to the book. And he, we were emailing back and forth. And he said, I'm enjoying your book. I was laughing a lot at this one section. I was laughing so much that it brought my wife to the, it brought my wife to the door of her study. And then he said, that sounds like a euphemism for foreplay. <laughs> I keep bringing my wife to the door of her study. <laughs> so anyway, I, I didn't even mean that. Um, anyway, uh, the challenges just uh, for a, a writer are actually uh, considerable. Um, first of all, it's, um, you know, it's a little awkward to say that you're right. Well, all of my books have been awkward. I'm getting used to that. Um, but I, 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 my, I like to go on the scene and be in the room when the science is happening, reporting with my notebook. And that's how I pitched this book to my publisher. I said, well, I'll be on the scene. And, you know, there's a really interesting sexual arousal and orgasm studies. And it didn't like, I didn't think this through, obviously, duh. I mean, you can't, I would call up the researchers and say, and so could I, you know, come and be in the room? I won't say anything. And they're like, no. Are you kidding? Are you nuts? I mean, it's hard enough to get these people to show up and to participate, and you want to come and, you know, with your notepad. So inevitably, it came around to, I know, why don't you be a subject? Why don't you volunteer yourself? And uh, in a couple of insta instances, this is what I ended up doing. Um, most memorably, the Dr. Deng episode. Dr. Deng is a, a, an interesting man who, um, he works in a um, city, University in London, and he's a he's uh, works in this medium called four-dimensional ultrasound, where he takes um, four-dimensional moving images of body parts in motion. And he had done a paper that was in the Lancet on puckering lips, and that was something that people who uh, do surgery surgery on cleft palate, you know, it helped them get a sense of how the musculature works by you could sort of, you know, maneuver through this amazing four-dimensional image. And then he moved on to um, an erecting penis, and it was actually his own penis. I asked. Um, <laughs> and in the, at the end of this paper, he said, and my next project, uh, I'd actually, uh, I'd like to do an image of the, um, uh, I forget how he, how he phrased it, but basically genitals in uh, having sex. And I wrote to him and said, I'd very much like to be there for this historic undertaking, and would that be okay? And he wrote back right away, and this is what he wrote. Dear Ms. Roach, you are welcome to interview me in London. However, to arrange a new inaction, that was his little euphemism, an inaction, would be uh, very difficult, mainly due to the difficulty in recruiting volunteers. If your organization is able to recruit brave couple for intimate study, I would be happy to arrange and perform one. So my organization gave this some thought. And <laughs> my organization called its husband. <laughs> I said, you know, honey, you know I haven't been to London in 25 years. Would you like to go? And we'll, you know, we'll go to see some shows and we can go to Stonehenge and we have to have sex in front of a guy in a white coat and we'll... <laughs> um, my husband is an incredibly uh, good egg. He really is. Uh, and all I can say, about the experience. If you, if you want to have a really interesting life, I recommend saying yes to things without giving it any more than the barest minimum of thought as to what you've agreed to do. And by the time you realize how badly you don't want to do it, it's too late. Uh, and that was, really, that was really what it was like. We just, you know, we had a lot of fun. And then we uh, went to the hospital and we were sitting in the hallway. And I just have this memory of Ed, who'd been, you know, Ed is very good, my husband Ed, at putting things out of his head as long as he can. You know, denial. He has a very good denial mechanism. But there was this moment when we're sitting in the little, you know, couch out in the hallway, in the waiting room, whatever, in the radiology department. And Dr. Dang starts walking down the hall. And Ed goes, oh, God, here he comes. <laughs> at that point, I just felt so bad. I'm a terrible person. And I, I owe him favors for the rest, for the rest of his life. Um, uh, and people say, well, how, because you know, this, this is something, I wanted to address this issue of like, what is that like to be a subject in a particularly, you know, not just, uh, you know, some studies, some sex studies these days are like, well, here's a drug, take this drug, keep a notebook, and how, tell me, you know, how does that affect how aroused, you know, how uh, your sexual desire level or how aroused you get or whatever. And it's, you know, you can do that without being embarrassed. Um, but these studies where people, one person or two pe people come and, and have, uh, do sexual things while being filmed or um, watched. I remember thinking when I read the Masters and Johnson work, um, which involved actually people coming in and having sex while being watched by people with clipboards, I thought, what is that like and who does that? But it's all the, the people who did it 
will remain um, anonymous, and uh, Virginia Johnson um, declined to speak with me. She, uh, she's quite old now. So it, in a way, I, I, I think you know, going through this experience, as, as awkward as it was, was a, a, a way to just answer that question. And, and I will answer that now, which is to say it wasn't like sex at all. <laughs> it was more like going to the hospital and knowing that you're going to have an awkward 20-minute procedure that you know, it's going to be sort of weird and embarrassing, but it'll be over, and then you'll go have a drink. And that's really what, that's really what it was like. I mean, um, I was actually taking notes through the whole thing. <laughs> Every man's worst nightmare. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, as, as weird as it all was, I mean, if you're going to have sex in front of anyone, Dr. Deng is a wonderful choice because he was so focused on his ultrasound. I mean, ultrasound, bear in mind, this is the one where they're, the, the person is right there and they're holding the wand. It's not MRI. MRI, at least you have the privacy of the tube. <laughs> You have your own tube, and no one sees you, and you know you end up look on film in some grainy manner that's not embarrassing. Um, but MR, but uh, ultrasound is a very—it's um, an intimate situation, you know, the two of you and the doctor. So, <laughs> although you know, he said, he, he, my husband joked at one point, you know, um, where's the the candlelight and the soft music? And Doctor <laughs> Doctor Dang, God love him, he goes, oh, I'm sorry, wait. Wait, on my laptop, I have the soundtrack to Les Mis. <laughs> uh, so that's okay. <laughs> um, even with your pants on, I found sex research to be a little bit of an embarrassment to be researching because uh, I, um, I, go, I use interlibrary loan a lot. I also use um, UC Berkeley libraries endlessly. Thank you, thank you. Do you see Berkeley libraries? Um, a godsend. Uh, and, but when I go to pick up my interlibrary loan books or I go to check out a book here, I have this, um, I always sort of watch the person who's, you know, pulling it up on the com computer, scanning my card and thinking that they're looking at this list of all the things that I've been taking out lately and wondering, what's wrong with her? <laughs> when I did Stiff, I actually, some of the titles, uh, uh, Phant oh no, this, for this one was Phantom Erection After Amputation of Penis. That was a journal article I ordered through Interlibrary <laughs> Loan. Uh, sonographic Observation of In Utero Fetal Masturbation. And my favorite, uh, Sexual Intercourse as a Potential Treatment for Intractable Hiccups. <laughs> I love this particular paper because they, at one point they talked about, uh, well they were saying, you know, there's this guy and he's hiccuping for a week and he can't stop and at some point he goes ahead and has sex with his wife and lo and behold, after it's over, he realizes his hiccups are gone. He tells his doctor and his doctor writes it up and gets it published and, you know, wanting to share this wonderful information for people. And then, and then there's a point in the paper where it says, unattached hiccupers may try masturbation. You know, they're just like <laughs> not wanting to leave anyone out. <laughs> I also love the fact that there's a, a demo, I like to, you know, it's a demographic, unattached hiccuppers. <laughs> Married, divorced, unattached hiccupper. <laughs> um, and I, I had this terribly embarrassing experience here at the library. Mm. Uh, it's a moment I'll never forget. I was Xeroxing a copy of a, a journal article called Vacuum Cleaner Use in Autoerotic Deaths. By the way, they don't mean to clean up afterward. <laughs> um, and I, the, the copier jammed. And I stood there thinking, it's in there, and there's, I, there's the woman up at the desk, and I thought I could go and get and she, her, and she'll open up the machine and help me and look down. <laughs> and so I just quietly moved on to the next copier. <laughs> it's probably still in there. Um, uh, when people hear about the topic of this book, uh, sex research. I mean, it's specifically, it's physiological sex research. It's not gender issues, and it's not the culture of sex. It's not, um, it's not any of that worthy stuff. It's specifically the laboratory stuff, arousal, orgasm, biomechanics. And people say, well, you know, tell me something I don't know. There's a very uh, almost universal sense that if you know how to have sex, you know everything there is to know about sex. And what could people possibly be studying? But it's like anything else. The more you learn about it, the more you realize how much there is to learn and how complicated it is. Um, and there's still some sort of basic large mysteries that remain unsolved. One of them that I found kind of fascinating um, 
has to do with a statistic that 70% of women do not have an orgasm from intercourse, sexual intercourse. I guess missionary, they didn't really say what position, which I think this is the problem. You know, you've got to be specific in these papers. Anyway, <laughs> one guy had this theory, uh, Kim Wallen, he's at Emory University, and he was doing research on the distance between the clitoris and the uh, opening of, of the vagina. Uh, thinking, you know, there was a lot of variation. There's all, you know, an inch or so of variation among women. And he was thinking, well, perhaps that is a major contributing factor and wouldn't it be interesting if there was a correlation? And um, he told me about this. He was not the first to look into this. There was this woman, Marie Bonaparte, who was Napoleon's great grandniece. And she got interested in this question. She was an amazing character. She was... Um, not an MD, but she got a paper published in a, a, um, a medical journal at the time, and it had to do with, she went and measured uh, something like 47 women. She interviewed them very specifically about their sexual satisfaction. She took measurements. She came up with three uh, categories. She divided women into three categories. She herself being a, uh, and I love to say this, teleclitoridienne, which means she of the distant clitoris. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she, she, you know, she published this paper, and, and it was... Uh, um, hold on. The, the, the sad thing is that she not only uh, she published a paper, she convinced herself so thoroughly that she uh, um, consulted with a surgeon she knows to have her clitoris uh, moved, to have her clitoris moved, surgically moved, um, and I'm not to her elbow, just sort of, you know, yeah. closer, closer. She had the operation done twice and it didn't help her, uh, and it's a, which is a sad you just wanted to take her aside and, you know, say, Marie, try another position, you know. <laughs> you know, there's lots of other things you can do. Um, and, and you could make the criticism of this research and say, well, it's interesting, but how does that help anybody? I mean, it's like saying the reason you're not very good at basketball is that your legs are short. You know, what, what do you do with that? Well, there's one practical application. Um, I was reading about transgender surgery, and uh, there was a surgeon who... Um, uh, help, helps men who are transitioning to become women, and he creates a neoclitoris, it's called, using a piece of the underside of the penis. And uh, I emailed him, and I said, where do you place that neoclitoris? And he wrote back and said, well, I put it at about at one inch, which is about average, because my patients will just want to look normal. And I wrote back, and I said, you should really think about putting that closer. <laughs> uh, I think I may have mentioned that the in, in the pig, the um, clitoris is actually inside the vagina. They're in, I think, the horse as well. It's, it's either right on the edge or very close. And that's great bioengineering, I think. So um, hopefully we're all evolving to be more like pigs in, um, in that particular way. Um, and pigs are my segue here. Pig, I have a pig segue. Uh, there's another, this is my segue to another enduring mystery of sex, uh, anatomical sex research. And this has to do with a, uh, a theory called upsuck, which is very fun to say, upsuck. Upsuck is uh, a, a theory that uh, when a woman has an orgasm, the contractions sort of serve to pull the semen up through the cervix and deliver it quickly to the egg, thereby raising the odds of conception. And in the animal world, there is some evidence for this, uh, particularly in pigs in, in Denmark. Um, they have enough evidence that they feel uh, it's worth a worthwhile uh, pursuit to, when they inseminate a sow, they sexually uh, stimulate the sow. Uh, and the, the uh, Danish National Committee for Pork Production, I believe it is, has a, a poster and a, a video that it shows um, the farmers how to do it. It's a five-step sow stimulation plan. Uh, and I went to Denmark and I watched this in action. And you wouldn't, you, you know, you go into the barn and if you saw them, at work doing their thing, you wouldn't think there's a man sexually stimulating a sow. That's really strange. You'd think that, you know, it's some sort of odd Masonic rite or something <laughs> involving, involving pigs. Um, they don't because the boar's um, foreplay techniques have nothing to do with, with the humans, with one exception, um, breast manipulation. It, it, pigs are the only other uh, species that regularly uh, incorporates uh, fondling the teat. So that, that is something that the, the poor inseminators have to reach down and they, they do this. Um, and the Danish National Committee for Pork Production was foolish enough to give me a video. <laughs> um, and there's a wonderful scene where they, you know, the guy is, this is handsome Danish guy in a white coat and he's very sort of business-like about it. And, but there's a moment where the camera zooms in on his left hand to, and shows, you know, his, his ring as if to say, 
it's, it's okay, it's just his job, he really does like women. <laughs> Uh, Masters and Johnson were upsuck skeptics, uh, which is also fun to say, <laughs> upsuck skeptics. Um, they didn't buy the whole thing, and they actually came up with a pretty interesting way. I mean, I kind of love Masters and Johnson. They're, they came up, they said, like, okay, this upsuck thing, I don't buy it. How can we see if this has actually happened? When a woman is, has an orgasm, is, it, is there any upsucking going on? How can we see, figure this out? So they recruited, I think it was seven women, and they set them up in front of an x-ray machine um, they mixed up some artificial semen and put a radio opaque substance in it such that it would show up on an x-ray. They positioned the women, you know, in front of the x-ray and, you know, had them, you know, masturbate. And then at the exact moment, they took some x-rays to see if there was indeed any upsucking going on. And they did not find any evidence of upsuck, sadly. Or not sadly, I don't know. I don't really have a strong opinion on it one way or the other. Um, <laughs> You may be wondering, how do you make simulated semen? I found in my research uh, over the two years that I worked on this book, uh, three recipes <laughs> for simulated semen. Uh, my favorite being the one that, um, you know how in a recipe it'll say, yield two dozen cupcakes or something like that. This one said, yield one ejaculate. <laughs> <laughs> one of these days I want to do a cookbook. I've got like, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> I like to, I regularly frighten my publicist with my ideas for holiday gift items. <laughs> I wanted to do a, um, a scratch and sniff edition of Stiff. She, she didn't reply to that email. Um, anyway, so I thought I would talk a little bit about um, orgasm, because it's an interesting topic. And I didn't really realize this before. It's a reflex of the autonomic nervous system. And it's, um, it is triggered by a surprisingly broad range of stimuli. Uh, Kinsey interviewed a woman who had orgasms from pressure on her gums, someone else just from stroking the eyebrow. Uh, there are people who have them in dreams. That's quite common. Spontaneous orgasm is a condition that is uh, not as rare as you would think. Uh, I came across a study a case study of a woman uh, in Saudi Arabia who was something like 30 times a day, just out of the blue. And you know, you just on cursory examination, you'd think, cool. <laughs> but um, it, for her, it was, they mentioned it had destroyed her social life. And also, me they mentioned that she could no longer um, perform religious rituals and visit shrines. So another consideration. Um, I interviewed a woman who uh, had trained herself to um, kind of think herself. It wasn't necessarily thinking, but she would do sort of a breath work and chakra imaging, whatever it was. She took her two years to master the technique, and she, but she could do it. And uh, she happened to be passing through Oakland, where I live, and we met for dinner at a sushi bar. And I said, so could you just do it right here? And she said, well, I, I could, but I'd rather f finish my dinner if you don't mind. <laughs> and, uh, but then she said, you know, well, maybe outside. So we sat on the bench on, um, on Grand Avenue, and uh, it took her like a minute and it was quite impressive. It's, it's subtle. It's not a Meg Ryan type of uh, situation at all. It was very subtle. It was sort of, she flushed a little bit, and there was a little shudder. And I thought, wow. I said, are you just doing this all the time? And she said, no, really, when I usually when I get home at night, I'm too tired. <laughs> she said the last time she had done it was at, uh, on the Disneyland tram. <laughs> Good a place as any. Um, so, I, and I wanted to, oh, you know, um, I have to get something out of my bag, but I thought I'd read you, the, I've, since this book came out, I've gotten the most delightful email. Hold on. It's not that, not that. Okay. Um, it's just, uh, also there was a talk I did at the TED conference where they didn't identify me as an author, and people think that I'm a researcher an orgasm researcher. So for the two weeks after this, this um, talk was up on the internet, I got the, like 10 emails a day from all over the world, and I just have to share some with you, because um, there was the woman who says, um, uh, you discussed a woman who thought she was, oh, there was a, there's a woman, I found a case study of a woman who regularly, when she brushed her teeth, would have an orgasm. And um, she, they, they thought maybe it was the toothpaste, she tried, switched her to another toothpaste, because she, she, this freaked her out. She thought she was possessed by demons. I mean, I would have just thought, you know, she'd have excellent oral hygiene, and <laughs> she's like, I got, excuse me, I'm gonna go brush my teeth. 
Uh, but you know, she uh, she she wasn't, she wasn't enjoying it anyway. So um, they realized that it was something about the complex, you know, psychosensory motor process of toothbrushing was triggering a small seizure in the part of the brain that is involved with orgasm. But this woman writes to me saying, um, "You discussed a woman who thought she was possessed when brushing her teeth." Um, so uh, let's see, I, on the other hand, brush my teeth several times a day. I don't reach orgasm every single time, but I can. And then she says, I, I, on a really good day, putting lip balm on does it for me. <laughs> this is kind of extraordinary. And then um, this one arrived. I am a 49-year-old male in Greece. From a very early age, I am able to produce an orgasm when riding my bike. And instead of going directly to my destination, I ride in circles to delay... <laughs> to delay my arrival. Whether it is the bike seat or the anxiety produced by the delay, it causes me to have an orgasm. You know, and then he says, uh, I, I hope this is useful in your research. <laughs> so yeah, it's, been, it's really been one after another. Um, uh, so there was a sinus clearing. This is another, apparently, uh, er, there's a small segment of the population in whom uh, orgasm, no, 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 it was when her husband has an orgasm, it triggers, it clears her sinuses regularly. And I, uh, just so just the point being that people are wired in, in amazingly different ways and it makes the study of orgasm very uh, challenging for researchers because it is such a, you know, I mean, there's some basic things. It's a, there's the, you know, the, the sacral nerve root is involved. It's the same part of the, the autonomic nervous system that has to do with, with, with defecation and urination and there's one other. Um, but so it's a, it's a, it's, there are certain things that are very um, straightforward about orgasm, but there's all this like crosstalk in the nerves and things that get just, people are having them in the darndest ways. Um, I'm gonna leave you with a, because I think I've been just jabbering on and on. I'm gonna leave you, I'm gonna read um, one last footnote, because if you guys are all still here at this point, I think you can handle this. <laughs> it's just a really fun footnote, but um, you know, it's not for everyone, but uh, um, I, I just wanna share it with you, because it's, it's, it's one of my favorites which probably says something about me. Okay. Um, this was a paper I, I stumbled onto. Um, it, it's called, the, the, the article is called uh, Rectal Foreign Bodies, colon, colon being the punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> Case reports and a comprehensive review of the world's literature. And it includes this amazing list of, of objects that doctors have removed from um, rectums over the years. And I, I wanted to just share some highlights. Um, a frozen pigtail. This is one of seven cases in a total, uh, seven female cases in a total caseload of 202. A bottle of impulse body spray. And this was, quote, incarcerated, love the verb choice. Incarcerated in a 37-year-old lawyer. This was the only time they felt it necessary to mention the occupation <laughs> of the patient. A parsnip, a plantain, parentheses, with condom. I guess you just don't know what you will pick up from a plantain. <clears throat> a dull knife, a cattle horn, a salami, a jeweler's saw, a plastic spatula. Multiple holdings in the same rectum are listed under the heading collections. <laughs> These include several that could pass as still life titles. Oil can with potato. Two apples. 402 stones. And several that probably couldn't pass as still life titles. Umbrella handle and enema tubing. Lemon and cold cream jar. And finally, my favorite, one that suggests a quiet evening at the Biltmore. Spectacles, suitcase key, tobacco pouch, and magazine. <laughs> So I think I'll just, that's it, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna take questions, but thank you very much. Thank you, um, and I'm, I, yes. Yes, questions, bring them on. About any, any books, about, you know. Well, since we're on the subject. Um, so this is obviously, as you said, the physiology of sex. Yes. But did, have, did you find any research or did you, is anyone doing research on the types of orgasm depending on fantasy, or you know, if a, if a participant is in, you know engaged in fantasy, or if they're not, or right. kind of fantasy, is there was there anything like that going on? Um, there are papers on fantasies, and they're very entertaining papers on what people are fantasizing and what, you know, wh who fantasizes but tends to fantasize about what. But I never came across one that looked at. Um, 
the intensity of the orgasm. The problem is that, is that you have to, um, when someone says they're having a fantasy, I mean, do you take, how do you, you know, scientists always like to have proof. It's like somebody, people often say, well, do, have you ever do people study love and orgasm? Does being in love make you more aroused, make your orgasms more intense? Well, how do you in a laboratory define love and make sure that everybody who says I am in love is experiencing the same thing? So I think that's, it's, you know, it's sort of a logistics or a, de a definition problem. So no, I didn't, but that would be interesting, yeah. Yes. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, did you get any literature or, uh, or information about the nasal erectile effect? Oh, well, I, um, I, it's in the book. And I, I was just, this, I, there, OK. There's only the genital system and the lining of the nose are uh, the two areas of the body that have erectile tissue. And people have said, no, the nipples do too. And it's like, no, it, the nipples actually, it's a, that's a muscular contraction that's causing the nipple to become erect. It's not erect, erectile tissue is this sponge-like tissue that gets engorged uh, when you're sexually aroused. And, and it, when you have a cold, you essentially have a nose boner. Um, <laughs> but in some people, some people, sexual arousal does cause you know they, th them to get congested. There's like there's some overlap. Is that what you meant? Or yeah, yes, yes. That, and I think that's pretty common, the 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 congestion thing. Um, so yes, it, it's I, I did come across that, and that's what makes my life so wonderful. Is that I kept going. Whoa! I never knew that nasal erections. Yes. After writing and researching for your first book, did you tear up a body donor card, or are you a body donor? Oh, that's a great question, and I'm conflicted over that. I have uh, in my office the donor forms. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah, okay. It has to do with, you know, what, what, how did researching stiff affect my uh, feelings about donating my own body to um, research? And um, I'm definitely, I've always been an organ donor. I feel very strongly about you know, making my, or my organs available for transplantation. But as for donating myself, you know, to become a cadaver for dissection or research. I have the papers for UCSF and for Stanford Medical Schools in my office, and I haven't gotten around at, um, pulling the trigger. I, I kind of feel like a high school senior where I want to, um, I want to go there and sort of check out the facilities and <laughs> see how, what, how's the view from the anatomy lab. And, but I, I haven't gotten to the point where I signed it, and I, and I quest wonder whether there's some part of me that, that you know, I, I kind of have such a vivid image of it that, I believe very strongly in it on principle, and I do aim to do it, but I haven't signed the papers yet. So that's a very good question. Yeah? How did you, what, who's funding these um, studies? And did you find any bias in terms of what is being funded, um, particularly like for males versus females, or and like um, orgasm versus female orgasm, or anything like that? Um, what gets funded? Uh, Right now, the easiest thing to get funding for is pharmaceutical solutions to low libido in middle-aged women. If that's what you want to study, just snap your fingers and somebody, some drug company will um, want you to test their, their drug. Um, and, and so there's a lot of it. That, that's the easiest thing to get funded for. So money, you know, researchers tend to gravitate toward where the funding is, um, pure, purely anatomical investigations are, are pretty rare. I mean, they happened in the 60s when this was this new frontier. Nobody had been doing, nobody looked at the physiology of arousal and orgasm. And so um, that, that's when a lot of that stuff was going on. There are a few holdouts, Roy Levin in England I visited, and he's, I mean, he, he's just someone who loves, it's just like has these questions in his head. And like he wanted, he was going to do, uh, he retired, but he wanted to do what would have probably been the first homosexual Physio sexual physiology study. I mean, he was like going to just do it himself because no one will fund <laughs> fund that. So it is political. It's definitely political. Um, not so much male. Right, right now, most of the work is being done in the female arena because Viagra came along, and that was you know there, there's a lot of options for male sexual dysfunction, but there's not. Uh, so they're all looking for, you know, the pill for the rest of the globe, you know, the other 50% of the globe. So all the, there's plenty of money now in, in female sexual dysfunction. But, you know, there's another polit political debate there in terms of are we medicalizing what is just a natural consequence of aging, you know, by saying, you know, libido 
dips after menopause, and you know, should should we be you know coming up with pills to to put people on? So anyway, that's a political issue. It's all it's all as political. In the yeah, you know, is that what does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. When you were first starting um, your research for stiff and, and brand new, nobody knew you from anybody. Was it difficult to get credibility when you called places like, you know, FBI labs and various other um, cadaver research places and say, I want to come and look? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very access is uh, for is always the biggest diffi difficulty. For, it's the biggest hurdle. Um, if you you know if you call and say I write for I'm I'm a reporter for the New York Times, your call will be returned right away. Um, partly because they know what the New York Times is, but also because they know, okay, you're doing a news story, and I'm comfortable with that. But when you call and say, oh, well, hi, I'm doing kind of this weird sort of funny book on cadavers, I mean, people, what is the, what's that? <laughs> and it's, there's no reason for them to say yes, really. Um, it's just out of the goodness of some of their hearts that they do. So yes, that actually was, I spend the endless amounts of time firing off emails, to people who don't know me, like sort of, thank God for email, because they have to do that on the phone. Hi, you don't know me, and I'm working on this book about cadavers, and you know, that, uh, so the, the, the email has made it easier. You can sort of put a bio of yourself, you can say this is what I'm doing, you can address some concerns they probably have in a letter. So I, used, I spend a lot of time drafting very carefully worded letters, emails. But yeah, it, Stiff was, a tough, was tough because of that, yeah. And a lot of people said no. You know, there's a lot of labs I would have liked to have gone to, but they didn't, either didn't return the email or just said, I'd, I'd rather not. Yeah. 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 I, I just want to ask about research methods and tools. So when you have an idea, do you just go off and start kind of randomly looking at stuff? And then does it involve notebooks, cameras, tape? Um, yeah. When I have an idea, I start from a point of um, near utter ignorance. And I, uh, I start out, I, I, there's a three month period of basically futile flailing, uh, where I'm looking on the internet, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing searches on PubMed, I'm trying to get the, the feel for who's out there in the world doing interesting work and who might I want to go visit. And that determines you know, what the chapters will be, because I like there to be a, a sense of narrative and a, a, a location and characters. So I'm constantly sending emails to people going, what's going on in your lab in the next year? And they'll send back, you know, links to papers published you know, years ago, which doesn't help me. So there's the, the futile hurling phase, the, the random flailing phase. Um, and then you know, once I know where I'm going and I've been there, then I start um, you know, amassing the other, you know, getting the obscure historical books and uh, the journal articles and all the, the, fill, you know, the, the information to fill out the narrative framework. So, but uh, it's a, and I'm, const, you know, I'm often thinking I'm gonna go do a, um, include a, a a research trip that then I find something more interesting and that I scratch that. So it's a constantly evolving organism that I often feel I have no control over. <laughs> so that's it. But I uh, um, tape recorder. I, I'm taking notes and if it's anything scientific, I don't trust myself to get it right. So I bring a tape recorder and then I transcribe it, which is tedious, but it, I just am uncomfortable trusting my own memory. And frequently, it's a sort of technical material that I, uh, I don't have a background for, and I'm going to have to call them back and get them to clarify. So uh, I haven't been up to this point um, taking videos or bringing cameras much, but I, you know, I'm feeling, of course, nowadays, you have to sort of have video. So for the next book, I'm sure I'll be bringing a little flip camera. And not that I know what I'm doing with it, but that seems to be where things are going. Yeah. Yeah. Since you're not initially an expert in any of your topics, how do you sort of evaluate the validity of different science claims that you hear? From different well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I work from primary sources. I work from journal articles and interviews. I don't, I don't use um, secondary, I don't use other people's books for the most part. But it's, you know, it's a, it's an issue of having to trust your instinct of this, this person seems to know the lay of the land well. I think I trust this person to kind of be my guide here. Because, um, I mean, I, I've done a lot of magazine work where, y you know, you end up, you can't interview everyone. Uh, and it ends up almost being like taking an opinion poll, as particularly with, with medicine. It's, you know, it's political. There's a lot of different, there, there's this, but then again, there was that study. So you almost, I almost feel like I want to find, I'm sort of profiling one person's work in a sense and not, I'm presenting them not as the be-all and end-all of 
information in this area, but just this is this is the work that they're doing. And but it's a, it's it's tough. Um, and I think even people with a background uh, struggle with that, like because you know you a paper comes out and then six months later something comes out that says the opposite. And where does the truth lie? So yeah, I did. That's another struggle. Along with that struggle, there's that struggle. <laughs> Yeah. What's next? Uh, I'm just finishing up a book about astronauts and the kind of odd, quirky, roachable aspects of living in, in, in space. So that, that's been fun, with the exception of having to deal with NASA, which is a government agency, which is very uncomfortable with the kinds of books that I do. Um, but uh, it's, you know, one of the, like, like all of my books, you know, you get to the end of it and you think, well, that wasn't that, that was kind of fun. Although there were times halfway through where I thought, I quit, I give up, I just quit. This was stupid of me. Um, but it, it's, um, look, it's again a mix of history, science, humor. So that's coming out in August. Yeah. Uh, it's called Packing for Mars. <laughs> I, I, we tried to find a one word. I mean, what? Blast, Zoom, uh, Countdown. A lot of them have actually been taken by um, astronaut memoirs. So <laughs> there's not, it's pretty slim pickings in the one word department. So. We, 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 we abandoned that. Also, I, I don't know, I just, it, it wasn't ever really a, um, a, a design, you know, a, a strategy to only have one word titles. We just, that's what I put on the proposal and I, think, I thought we would change them and we would go through, you know, hundreds of different title ideas and then end up back at the beginning with all three books. I thought, no, that won't be the title. That's not a very good title. And then we, we couldn't find something we liked better, so. Um, anyone else? Ooh, oh, hi. So, do you have children, and if so, what do they think about Bonk? Ooh, <laughs> participation in it. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I have two stepdaughters, twenty and twenty-four, and um, they, my my older stepdaughter, when she heard, because neither of them would read stiff, they thought it was disgusting, and. Um, when I told them what Bonk was about, my older stepdaughter, Lily, said, oh, sex, all right, this one I'll read, great. And then, as time went on, uh, she got wind of the, um, the Dr. Deng incident. <laughs> and I will quote her reaction. It was one word. She went, ew. <laughs> ew. Uh, so she refused to read it. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think my younger stepdaughter has read it either, no. So... So yeah, they're, but they're just so, I don't, my, they, their stepmother is a strange individual and they're used to it. And you know, it's just, I, th I think if they were a, a lot younger, it might be a, 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 a sort of source of embarrassment for them, but they're like, my, my, but and now that some of their friends are reading the books, they're like, cool, she's kind of famous. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I've got some points now, whereas early on I was just very strange. <laughs> uh, um, any, well, uh, yeah. Was Bonk the hardest for you to research and write because of the lack of participatory access to research? Um, I think actually the space one was the hardest for me to, because it, I, I thought that it was going to be just NASA, but in fact it's anybody who's a contractor for NASA because if they get in, you know, if they say the wrong thing, then their contract won't be renewed. So people are just uncomfortable, generally uncomfortable talking to someone like me. But there, you know, God love them, some individuals out there who were fine with it and didn't really care what the public affairs office thought. But that one, that, I think that's been the hardest one for that reason. And then Bonk, probably second. But then, you know, all, all of them have various hurdles in research access-wise, yeah. Um, is that it? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.